Hello, hello. Hey. Hello. Good afternoon. If we have it all here. I think we're there all assembled. Is. All right. Look at that. We got three-way Skype going. <laughs> all right. All right. How advanced are we? Big time. Well, thanks for thanks for joining us, Ben, for a, a discussion about uh, Border Patrol suspicionless checkpoints on the interior, and my case in particular. I appreciate your time. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Terry Bressy or not of CheckpointUSA.org. I've heard of it, but I, I I don't think we've ever met. Okay, he's um he's really been on the forefront for uh, the fight uh, for constitutional um, activity or restraining the unconstitutional activity at these checkpoints, um, both in the courtroom, um, in his car, documenting hundreds of encounters and uploading them to YouTube um, and on his website, um, and as well as in the media, uh, NPR and and a, and a few other things. But uh, Terry, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, Ben. It's nice to meet you. Um, hold on a second. I just got a message. You're sitting down. It's called this one. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, my name is Terry Brassi, and I am uh, the chief engineer for an astronomical research group at the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Lab. Um, and I've been traveling back and forth to uh, Kitt Peak National Observatory along State Route 86 uh, for quite a few years now. The last 10 or so, I've, uh, I routinely encounter checkpoints as I go along there. Border Patrol has set up a checkpoint basically along this east, uh, and, e east and west highway that never intersects the, uh, the border at any point. So I just wanted to give you an idea that these checkpoints that we're, not t that we're talking about here are not border checkpoints. They're internal checkpoints removed from the border or its functional equivalent where both the legal analysis differs uh, greatly and the intrusion upon the rights of Americans uh, trying to travel about their own country. Um, some of these internal checkpoints are located along what they call nexus points for border traffic. That's where the road actually intersects the border, and a lot of the traffic along, uh, along it will go uh, to the border and, and, and cross it. Whereas uh, a lot of the other checkpoints don't, such as the one that I'm forced to go through and the people that, that live in southern Arizona in this part of the country, where we go through these checkpoints that are 30, 40, up to 90 miles away from the border, never intersect the border at, at, at any point. Nobody going along that road, for the most part, actually crosses the border, yet we have Border Patrol agents who aren't patrolling the border, interfering with the rights of people trying to travel and compelling them to try to prove their innocence. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background there with regards to the types of checkpoints that we're talking about here. Sure. Let me just uh, just interject real quick. I'm, I'm not sure if you guys know. You probably don't. <laughs> uh, I actually grew up on the U.S.-Mexico border. Okay. Uh, I grew, oh. grew up in El Paso. Oh. So, so I'm actually very, very familiar with what you're talking about, which is one reason that actually excites me that we're talking about this because, yeah. um, as you guys probably know, you know, in El Paso, we're surrounded by checkpoints yeah. um, sure. to, the, to the west, yeah. to the north, to the east, you can't leave, get in or out of El Paso without going through checkpoints. So huh. uh, very familiar with what you're talking about. Oh. And, and I know um, Josh Cook, uh, I think in August, wrote an article on benswan.com about the checkpoints that go 100 air miles from the border, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, but almost I had, humorous, though. Almost humorous. Almost that, humorous. Um, yeah. that would be only because he, you know, people get all upset about this, right? This right. idea that, oh, wait a minute, what, what's going on? Uh, we're, we're reaching the point now where, where uh, they want to have constitution-free zones all of a sudden. Right. And I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. I'm 35 years old. My entire life we lived in a constitution-free zone. That's yeah. not, it's not new. Yeah. It's, yeah, so I'm with you guys, yeah. It's amazing. I mean, and, and, and it's evolved so much. And that if, if you don't mind, I'll briefly talk about my, my, uh, my case and why I think it's an evolution or a de-evolution of the Fourth Amendment in particular and try to compare it and contrast it with the way Terry has done it um, and then get your, your thoughts on that. Um, sure. Yeah, in, in my case, um, the, you know, to compare and comp contrast with Terry, the reason I think my case is important is because, um, number one, it's, it shows that not even cooperation with the programmatic purpose is enough anymore. So while Terry would exert his rights very forcefully when he goes through there, I mean, he wouldn't go to secondary, he would not answer any questions, he would not provide them identification. Um, and while there's a lot of people that have this bias in favor of unchecked government power, and, and, and they love to say, well, why don't you just cooperate and be on your right. way? Well, That's right. and, and they can make that claim to Terry, and I know Terry would have a great response to it, um, but they can't make that claim to me, but they yet they still do. Um, in, 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 I went there, and I didn't exert my rights, and I'm kind of ashamed to, to admit that. I didn't exert my rights at all. I completely cooperated with the programmatic purpose of it. 
I went to secondary. I answered this seven. A, this was at a border patrol checkpoint? Yes, in uh, okay. Del Rio or outside of Del Rio, Texas. Okay. So 67 miles from the border. I went to secondary and I answered 17 of 18 questions they asked me. Um, and the 18th question I didn't ask or answer was because they asked me who my boss was um, at my place of employment because they wanted to contact him at 30 minutes into the detention. Um, and Terry and I have both had our, you know, our bosses called and been harassed by the Border Patrol after the fact. But I answered all their questions and I offered them a driver's license, a military ID, and two passports. In fact, I was the one who, who even brought up citizenship or immigration status to begin with um, at 11 minutes in because they didn't even think to even ask a question related to immigration status. And I brought it up by saying, would you like a passport? You know, because I'm trying to just go down the road and be on my way. So it's interesting that even cooperating with their programmatic purpose isn't even enough anymore um, to keep from being detained for 34 minutes and have your, your boss called at your place of employment. Um, so I just think it's kind of fascinating. That's interesting. So, so you said your case. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a suit? I do. I do. Okay. And, and it's, it, it actually got dismissed um, in uh, Del Rio, Texas. And before discovery, so right off the bat, and, and the thing that's interesting there, and, and this is why I also think it's very important in my case, is because um, what the district court in Del Rio did was removed all the protections from the Supreme Court and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that has jurisdiction. They removed it because they made two arguments. The first argument was 34 minutes for an immigration inspection, no problem, totally reasonable which flies in the face of the Supreme Court and Machuca Barrera by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that says a stop of a couple of minutes is, is constitutional. Um, and now the get out of jail free card for them, I mean, for them to make a real claim would be to say that there was reasonable suspicion for some criminal activity um, right. that, that could, and that's what they did. They made the second argument, which just obliterated this idea of reasonable suspicion. Um, they, instead of, bringing up articulable facts for reasonable suspicion, they instead just brought up a laundry list of possibilities. That's what they said, possibilities. Possibly drug smuggling, possibly alien smuggling, despite the fact that the drug dog did not hit on my car, um, or possibly I was a lookout for contraband vehicles behind me. And the government itself didn't even make the argument that they had reasonable suspicion. But this that judge, the court? The court yes, made? the judge fabricated it just out, conjured it out of thin air. Um, and, and, and if you watch the 34 minute video of the detention, which is on veteransagainstpoliceabuse.org, you'll okay. see that, the, that the, the primary agent over and over again said he did not need reasonable suspicion. And in fact, he said he had mere suspicion, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Mere suspicion is only a standard allowed on the actual border by their own Border Patrol handbook. It is not reasonable suspicion. It's just much like this judge's, what I call possible suspicion, like mm -hmm. that's just, oh, something's possible. Um, right, it, like you're, you're, you're on the border, therefore we have reason to suspect that you're crossing illegal. Right, it, 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 they have, but the higher version is reasonable suspicion on the interior. Like there's no suspicion and they have to have something better than, well, he could possibly be on his way to San Antonio to launder money or to, you know, but if they can come up with a possibility like this judge did, um, apparently in the district, uh, you know, there in Del Rio, that's perfectly acceptable, which means there is no limit because of course it's always possible that someone's going to commit a crime. Possibly they're premeditating murder once they get through the checkpoint. That's not reasonable suspicion and it makes a mockery of it and it removes all the limits of the Supreme Court um, and, and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and I'm really hoping the Fifth Circuit takes a look into it. Any idea whether um, what the timeline looks like on that? Um, we'll be appealing or filing the appeal, the actual appeal itself here, within a, probably roughly a month. Um, okay. And, right. um, but we have filed the notice to appeal and, and we're on our way and we're working on the appeal brief now. So what do you hope to accomplish through the, through the lawsuit? Well, what I hope to accomplish is I hope, I mean, you know, you're just fighting inch by inch and, you know, three steps back trying to hope to get one inch back, you know, forward with the Fourth Amendment. And I'm just, man, I'm not even sure if, okay, if I can accomplish anything. I just have to fight the fight. I have to fight for the Constitution because there's no other choice. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and Terry, um, your organization is, is doing what right now? 
Uh, well, uh, we are constantly trying to bring attention to the types of abuses that occur at, at these checkpoints. Uh, I've, uh, we've been submitting uh, FOIA requests uh, to the Customs and Border Protection, Border Patrol, local and both national offices, Department of Justice, and to date, uh, uh, none of the federal agencies have responded to these FOIA requests. I'm sure you know, uh, are you familiar with a, a, what a FOIA request is? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and of course, I have filed many of them. <laughs> <laughs> With your background, you have a lot, of, a lot of experience with that sort of thing. So, uh, I, I certainly do too, and I have mixed results depending on what it, which agency I, I actually submit them to. But the Homeland Security, of course, is the worst by far. Absolutely, and I've a responsive reply from them ever, and that means just in that fact alone, they're in violation of federal law because they're required to go through a specific process. Even if they're going to deny your your FOIA claim, they have to they have to cite the specific statutory authority which uh, they're relying upon to not, you know, give you access to public records that they have in their possession. And, and they have and to it has to happen within a certain amount of time, too. Right, and, exactly. Or, or they open themselves up to lawsuits. But, of course, as you probably know, too, lawsuits are expensive, they're time-consuming, and that sort of thing. So just the fact that you, you know, so here we have a situation where federal agents, you know, are seizing you, absent suspicion along public highways inside the country, and demanding that you prove your innocence and prove who you are, yet the same agency that, they, that these agents work for refuse to comply with existing federal law. You know, I'm not required to identify myself or prove my innocence upon demand when they don't have any reason to believe I've done something wrong. But they are legally required to answer my questions when I submit them as a FOIA request under federal law, yet they refuse to do so. So there's a clear hypocrisy, a clear double standard going on here. And uh, the abuses just keep on mounting as you know the Border Patrol has grown in size from 3,000 agents back in around 2000, 2001 to about 22,000 nowadays. And of course, now they have more manpower and more resources to throw, throw at internal checkpoints instead of doing their job trying to secure the actual border. So I think more and more people are being you know, are, are, are running across these checks point, checkpoints for the first time. Like you, you said, you know, you, you live down and grew up in, in the El Paso area. Well, that's always been a, a hotbed for Border Patrol activity down there. But as the resources have grown, these checkpoints are moving further and further inland. They're affecting larger and larger population centers away from the border and affecting more and more communities that don't have any direct nexus to the actual border itself. And well, I think uh, you, could, you could probably make, the probably make the argument, too, that in most cases, they're, they're not even dealing with border issues at a lot of these checkpoints. They're not even, right. not even pretending to deal with border issues. Absolutely. So they, they'll, they'll justify it um, in terms of uh, uh, things like, this is the war on drugs. And right. We're trying to stop drug smugglers. We're trying to catch yeah. uh, narcotics. And so they, yes. there's, a, there's a justification aspect that I think even most Americans would probably even agree with. Oh, yeah. well, you know, there, it's the war yeah. on drugs, and they have to do that. you got to... Right. Got to prevent drugs, and so it, it becomes this. Um, law enforcement has has been developing almost like this single focus of justification for everything, and you justify uh, warrantless wiretaps because well, we caught drug dealers with it. And right. So, um, sure. Yeah, it's interesting. So, so what is the the the? Um, is there an activist component besides the the legal issues, which are very important, by the way? I don't want to downplay that at all. But sure. is there an, uh, an activist issue that's taking place in terms of you all getting you know grassroots folks out to, to protest this, to raise awareness? What, what does that process look like? Well, well, I, I know Terry will talk about it, but he's been he's he's probably the single most important person or presence online I've seen when it comes to dealing with checkpoints. So I know he's a motivating factor for people. For myself, I don't consider myself an activist. Um, I, um, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a military officer and I took an oath to defend the Constitution and I've seen people lay down their lives for it. Uh, so that is, that is what motivates me. And I happen to be a very big fan of this imperfect document called the Constitution and our liberties. Um, so for me it's very important, but it's more than that, it's my duty. Um, now I have a lot of activist friends, you know, copblock.org, uh, Peaceful Streets Project. There are a lot of allies that are out there that have maybe a slightly different take that I, I will ally myself with in a, in a, in a large way, uh, especially uh, as I get out of the military. But for me, it's just about my professional duty and being a good American. Said I, I need to uh, I need to go through this checkpoint on a regular basis to get back and forth from a work site. So I probably go through a border patrol checkpoint once uh, every um, once every week. About uh, yeah yeah about fifty to sixty times a year on, on average. 
And, um, you know, since my first encounter um, at a checkpoint, which was actually run by local police with the help of Customs and Border Patrol agents, um, where I was dragged out of my vehicle, handcuffed and arrested, charged with a couple of misdemeanors, I fought those charges in court, I had them dismissed, I turned around and filed a lawsuit uh, that lasted about 10 years and just settled about uh, back in 2012 with a large settlement in, in my favor. But um, since that time, yeah, and this also gets into why I've gone to activism as opposed to um, um, a more of a, a Richard's type approach where I was very, I had my window rolled down that first checkpoint experience. I was very conversational with the officer. I said, look, these are my concerns, you know, you know, can you tell them what's going on here? You know, I, I realize what you're, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they didn't care. You know, they just wanted my immediate obedience didn't care about any of my, uh, of my concerns, and because I, I wasn't immediately, you know, bowing down to kiss their feet, you know, I was, uh, I was, um, I was a threat to them, and they treated me accordingly. And that's the problem when you empower police officers or law enforcement officers of any stripe to seize people absent reason to believe that that person has done anything wrong to begin with, and that's the whole nature, of course, of a checkpoint. So, um, um, so I went from you know being very um, accepting and complimentary of police for the most part to saying, hey, this is getting out of hand. Someone needs to draw attention to it. So from from that point on, I started outfitting my vehicle with cameras because once you get into a court system, when it's your word against the police or a border patrol agent, you know you're going to lose that battle unless you have independently available evidence. So now every time I go through, I have two or three cameras running. And I exercise my rights. I know, because so I already know they're not interested in what I have to say. So, um, and they're and they're hoping that you don't know what the law is. So, I just keep quiet. I I run the video cameras, and uh, I let them decide whether or not they think they have enough probable cause to bring charges against me. And to date, I've never been you know dragged out of my vehicle since. You know, because now they know I actually have some teeth behind me. I know a lot of lawyers. I have a lot of people that I know online and I exercise my rights. So they know it's gonna cost them something if they decide they're gonna play that type of game again. But so my, my whole purpose is to, uh, I, I wanna educate other people about A, the fact that these checkpoints exist. A lot of people don't. I still get emails to this day from people from inside of the country that say, hey, I never even realized that the, you know the federal government had these types of checkpoints in existence to begin with. So A, that's the first thing. It's just uh, making people cognizant of the fact that these checkpoints exist. And B, the second issue is to analyze how the checkpoints are being conducted, uh, both from a primary perspective, are, you know, is the idea of a checkpoint constitutional to begin with, here's how the courts have ruled on it, and B, if the courts have ruled on it and the courts have put these limitations in place, are the, uh, is the Border Patrol, is Customs and Border Protection, are they operating within the boundaries that have been put in place to protect our rights while authorizing uh, these agents to seize us to investigate, uh, investigate us in the first place. And back in 1976, when the U.S. Supreme Court considered this issue in U.S. versus Martinez Forte, uh, they said, look, uh, we're, uh, we realize that stopping people absent suspicion is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. But because there's a compelling government interest to secure the borders and because the checkpoints are being conducted um, in a way that we consider minimally intrusive, we're going to authorize very brief stops uh, for checkpoints like immigration checkpoints where there's limited scope uh, of the checkpoint. It has to be limited to immigration queries, uh, that it's limited in duration, and any further um, uh, detention or any uh, searching has to be premised on consent or probable cause. This is back in 1976, and for the most part, the Border Patrol was operating like that. Nowadays, they have drug-sniffing dogs that run around your vehicle, um, they hold you for long periods of time. They ask you questions having absolutely nothing to do with, with immigration status. In fact, in fact that's Richard's uh, experience there. It was 11 minutes. They hadn't even asked him what his, what his citizenship was. He had to bring up the, uh, the question to them as opposed to the other way around. So they're using these checkpoints as a pretext to push other federal policies uh, and other federal enforcement uh, regimes that have nothing to do, to do with immigration while hiding behind the immigration purpose. In fact, the checkpoint I go through not only has the Border Patrol there, but they also have a DEA suspicious camera array system. So they have two cameras with automated license plate readers and six additional cameras set up at different angles and, and viewing angles and that sort of thing that record everything there is to record about vehicles entering and exiting the area. 
This information is being uh, data mined and shared with local and federal law enforcement agencies. And it's all being done under the umbrella of uh, this immigration uh, checkpoint. So if it was just an immigration checkpoint operating under the minimal guideline or the, the guidelines put in place by the Supreme Court, then why is the DEA there? Why are Border Patrol agents cross-certified to enforce federal drug laws? Why are the drug dogs sniffing every vehicle that enters the checkpoint? And what are they detaining for as long as they want? You know, it's interesting because you hear you're all this alphabet soup, and there's so many facets to this Fourth Amendment issue. It's just enormous. Um, and so I just want to say at this point, uh, Ben, thank you so much for all of your reporting um, because you, you've covered it across the spectrum in ways that I can't even tell you how much I really appreciate. Um, and, uh, and, and you're being very gracious here because we've gone far beyond the 15 minutes uh, that I, I, I asked you to, to help me with. But... Um, so um, I, I really appreciate your time. I'm not trying to end this or anything, but I just, I just want to throw that out there. I know you're all well, I, I, busy. I definitely appreciate that, and I appreciate the work you guys are doing. Um, it is a, I think you're describing problems that, again, they aren't uh, foreign to me at, on any level. Um, but to, as you said, to many, many millions of Americans, they are. Uh, there are many people who have no idea uh, that this is happening every single day on our border. Uh, and the reality is, is that you can't necessarily point to, um, you know, huge numbers of cases where people uh, feel feel violated by these. The, most people who go through the checkpoints, in fact, I would say most of the people I know who go through them on a regular basis are so used to them um, that it's just a part of their, their process, it's part of their life. Um, but the important issue, and I think this is where the work you guys are doing is so important, is that it shouldn't be normal. It shouldn't be normal to be questioned uh, for long periods of time or to allow law enforcement to be able to stop you, as you said, your vehicle, um, and, and have drug-sniffing dogs surround you and, and uh, you know, to be questioned on everything. And, and the reality is, too, um, so much of it is based on the color of your skin. You know, if you go through a checkpoint and you have brown skin, you're going to be stopped. Uh, you're going to be questioned on certain things. Um, if you're lighter skinned, you're, you won't be questioned as long in some cases. And I'll tell you guys another secret. If you're in a news vehicle, you don't get questioned at all. Yeah. <laughs> we used to drive through. We used to, uh, for the stations I worked for down in El Paso, we would drive through Border Patrol checkpoints. They hated us. <laughs> they, didn't, they never wanted to stop us. They didn't want us asking questions or getting video. So we, they would just wave us through every single time. We, we would drive through, and, and uh, we used to joke all the time about we could be smuggling all kinds of stuff uh, through those checkpoints if you just put it in a marked news unit uh, because they just wave us through. Yeah. So. Uh, we see it happening all the time, and uh, it's something that, as you said, you know, folks have given up this right, um, and and we're, you know, you give up a little bit of the right, and then we watch. And I think, um, you know, Terry, you're talking about this a lot, but we watch the encroachment take a little bit more, take a little bit more, take a little bit more, and you find yourself today where uh, you have checkpoints where the dogs are being trained uh, to to uh, signal. Uh, you know, you tap the the side window in a certain way and the dog will jump at it and oh there we got an alarm we got a, a sign from the dog and so now they're searching your vehicle um so you know it happens and it's all happening in the name of security it's happening in the name of uh protection for americans but we're really not being protected by it you know and and the harsh reality to it also if, if you've been on the border and you've uh, been around a lot of this is that there is so much corruption within organizations like ice but oh, yeah. candidly, I mean, in, I think you can make a pretty strong argument, especially if you've researched it at all, and I'm sure you guys have, um, yeah. that ICE itself may be the most corrupt um, agency within Homeland Security. So if you're breaking them down into you know, individual agencies, but ICE is such a corrupt agency. There's so much corruption in Border Patrol, um, and we see it all the time, and, and we talk about the war on drugs, but the reality is that ICE and Border Patrol facilitate a lot of that, not as, not as agencies per se, but certainly individuals within those agencies uh, facilitate it. And so uh, there, this is a multi-layered problem, but I appreciate what you guys are doing to try to bring attention to it, and, and I'd love for us to be able to find ways to help you to do that. Thanks so much, Ben. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, are, are you guys recording on your end? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so, so let me know whenever we're done with the recording. A couple things I'd like to talk to you about um, when we're done with that. Okay. Great, and uh, I'll go ahead and end it here. Thanks again so much, Ben, and thank you, Terry. Um, thank you. One second.